my name is Ashok Chandra, the extension sugar beet pathologist with the University of Minnesota. I will be moderating this uh, rest of the morning session here. The first speaker for today is uh, Samantha Root. Uh, she is a uh, PhD student with uh, Dr. Kouriers and me with, at the University of Minnesota Department of Plant Pathology. She'll be talking about evaluation of disease severity assessment methods for uh, resistance to economizes and sugar beet. So I'm very pleased to be talking to you all today, doing the first plant pathology talk of the day. Um, as Ashok said, I'm talking about evaluating disease severity for Athanomyces root rot of sugar beet. So a bit about Athanomyces, I know it's a little bit less flashy than Cercospora. Um, Athanomyces root rot is caused by the pathogen known as Athanomyces curculoides, because we're very clever with naming in this system. Um, the pathogen is pretty widespread across the Red River Valley area where we grow sugar beets. Part of why it's so prevalent is that it can overwinter in fields for at least 10 years, which means that it's kind of always there silently waiting for a good season. Control is really limited to chemical seed treatments and the use of genetic resistance. Resistant varieties exist, but none of them are completely immune. And so that seems like an area of opportunity for where I can slide in. Um, environmental conditions play a big role in disease severity. So dollar amounts associated with losses can vary widely from season to season. And a lot of that is due to environmental conditions. But if you don't prep for disease, naturally that'll be the year that pressure is really high. So it's always kind of something to think about. There are different symptoms, partially because this pathogen is a full season pathogen. Seedling phase over here, what we see is post-emergent stamping off. What's very characteristic are these dark thread-like epicotyls. Um, as you might imagine, that makes plants really susceptible to wind damage because there's nothing really keeping them there, which is a big problem up here. Um, for adult or seedling plants, we will see foliage that wilts, becomes chlorotic. It's very indistinct to anything else. It looks like wilting sad plants. Um, but if you get infection later in season, you'll see the scarring of roots. That's really characteristic. You'll also see stunting and malformation of roots. Oh, I'm blocking the laser. Um, as you might imagine, all of that will really decrease your amount of extractable sucrose in your yields. And sometimes you won't even necessarily know how bad it is until harvest. So again, it's all about prevention is the goal. In terms of disease cycle, I'm the pathologist. I have to show this. Oospores are our primary inoculum. Motile zoospores are the infectious unit, so they can swim to roots. Um, this is what I use as my inoculum source. So little guys. Zoospores can insist on roots and start actually breaking into root material. And that part of the cycle can repeat a lot. Oops. We see hyphae inter and intracellularly in a root tissue. Um, it can grow quite vast across the entire root. And eventually we will see sexual reproduction. We only need one isolate. It can sexually reproduce with itself and it will because that produces oospores, which can then last at least 10 years in debris or soil. So that's good about the cycle. The question you may be asking is, why are you talking about disease severity assessment and not just disease resistance? And that's because I'm trying to focus on disease resistance, but in order to do that, I need to decide how best to phenotype my plants. So my PhD project is focused a lot on understanding more about this pathosystem. And specifically, we want to associate regions of the genome in sugar beet with um, resistance to the pathogen. So I need to phenotype all my plants. Most field studies are done in disease nurseries but I want to take them into the greenhouse because I can do a lot more. I don't have to wait for the season, a lot more control. We are also comparing different isolates. So we have to artificially inoculate. So we know exactly what isolate is in the ground. Um, so there's just been a lot of things to figure out in terms of how to inoculate and then how to score things. Oh, the other aspect of that is I'm using some varieties for this genomic work that have very varied resistance. So having more measures of phenotypic resistance is helpful for me so that I can differentiate between lines that seem quite similar. 
So experimental design, I was using two different isolates from different disease nurseries. We tried a bunch of different zoospore concentrations. All of them are for each one of these little pots. We inoculate two weeks after planting because our zoospores need a plant to swim towards. We pull dead plants throughout the experiment, and then we score them two weeks after inoculation. Honestly, by that two week point, um, not a lot is left to score. So it's usually very fast, which is very nice. In terms of scoring, we use a zero to three scale with a zero being perfect, a three being dead or dying. Um, we also like to confirm that we actually have the phantomyces because it's very indistinct. So we look for these really characteristic zoospore clusters. And that tells us we definitely have the phantomyces. I'm going to be talking about doing some above ground scoring. So this rating scale is used when we pull every single plant at the end of the experiment, but I also scored plants throughout the experiment. So I put a little box on the areas that I looked at specifically to see, it was mostly just how far up the root has the hypocotyl or has the necrosis got. So in terms of disease assessment methods, I did a couple of things. One of them was stand counts. So we counted plants roughly every day. Um, and we always pull dead plants. When we're looking at this data, it's always based off of percentage of plants relative to our emergence at inoculation day, because that can be extremely variable when you're using experimental varieties that aren't primed. Um, I also do robot index values, which use that zero to three scale. We pulled anything that got pulled counts as a three because it was dead at day 14 and everything else gets rated. And I also played around with area under the disease progress curve or AUDPC, um, which was that above ground scoring that I did. So that way um, we could kind of see how disease severity changed over the course of infection. And I will walk you through what that data looks like. So. Across the top, I have different varieties. They're all somewhat resistant to aphanomyces, but they differ. Um, and two different isolates down the side in my inoculum concentrations. So these are just counts of how much, how many plants were left over time. Generally, we found that it fit nicely with our inoculum concentrations, that we tended to see the least amount of disease, the lowest and the highest at the highest. That was not necessarily true for this one isolate where the highest inoculum concentration is doing very weird things and not always killing plants. Um, more on that in March at ASSPT. Um, but the point about this data that is good and bad is that it really just captures how many plants are alive and not much more. So like in instances here where it kind of levels off for multiple days, that doesn't tell me anything about disease severity or more plants like dying at that time point. Like you just kind of only know what's alive. And sometimes a plant isn't alive or it's alive, but it's not doing great. You want to distinguish that. I also have my root rot index values. For this, again, we tended to see the most disease at our highest dose and the least at the lowest. And again, this one isolate was just doing wonky things in terms of how things ended up. Um, the thing about root rot index value, it's really good for an overall picture of resistance. It's done at the end of the experiment, so you know how everything fared. There is a lot of variation as evident by the size of some of these bottom spots. So if things survive, there's a large variety in, in survival. If everything dies, then you know it looks perfect. So there seems to be like maybe missing information. The other thing is that this doesn't really capture the fact that for some varieties, everything died on like day two, and some varieties, things didn't die until day 14. So this doesn't really capture that. Hence, disease progress curves. So these are my above ground scoring metrics. Um, again, similar trends and similar plot setup. And the thing about area under the disease curve data or disease severity data is this was incredibly time intensive. It's really helpful. You got a lot more information. It doesn't look like it because it's just a line graph, but in terms of information, it was helpful. But oh my God, it took forever. But this data is a lot more descriptive. And so depending on what you want to do with your data, that might be quite helpful. So I also looked at how those different measures of disease resistance or severity correlated with each other. So on this one, my y-axis 
is the rewrite and that's the, like the disease severity score I took at each day, not day 14, just my area, my disease progress values. And that actually matched up fairly nicely with percent stand. It was fairly linear. It seems like there is a good relationship there. When I looked at my rewrite rot index value at day 14 versus my like singular AUDPC value, which is all of my time points collapsed into one, you can see that it's much less linear. I mean, it's still it's a, a fairly linear con correlation, but it's not great. So it seems like maybe there's something to be said about this is capturing information that this one isn't, or maybe some of the extremely dead plants, have, there's differences there. So, I mean, this is very much interesting to me. I don't know necessarily what it means, but it does mean that I know what I'm going to look at more. So my roundup is a table, because who doesn't like a table? Um, I did some analysis looking at different variables in my um, data. So my isolates, my inoculum concentration, the different varieties I use, concentration by isolate, and other things. For percent sand, all of those were considered to be significant. Thing about percent stand, it's not really easy to compare values because you have so many from all your different time points and your time points might not match up from experiment to experiment. But it's really useful for comparing how many plants survived, what does that line look like in terms of survival rate for AF. Rootbot index value had similar findings statistically to percent stand, except for concentration isolate was not significant. What's nice about this is it's a very comparable value. It uses a rating scale. You only have one time point though, um, but it's still a really good value for just getting a strict, where did this line fall? You can compare different lines really easily. You could easily come up with a threshold value. It has a lot of benefits. For AUDPC, we found yet different things. For some reason, my varieties were not significantly different in that one case. So that's telling me that something this data is finding differences in varieties that were not otherwise apparent, which is exactly why I wanted to do that study. So I was very pleased with that. One thing that's nice, you can get a singular value, um, but you do have multiple time points. So it's easy to compare and has multiple, it uses a rating scale. It's good for getting ideas of severity throughout time. The downside is the time. So I think when you when I was putting this together, my answer ended up being what method works best is what research question do you have? If you want to know how a line is doing, just survival rate. All you care about is did they make it to the end of the season? Why would you do anything other than percent stand? If you care what they looked like, how much they could survive, I guess, at the end, root rot index value is great. You need to get a lot more phenotypic differences between varieties that are otherwise quite similar, then your best bet is probably AUDPC. And in that case, plant fewer plants so it doesn't take you multiple hours every day that you want to do that. And with that, I'm done. So I would like to say thank you to my PI, Ashok, my co-advisor, Corey Austin, for helping me very much and taking me to my first ever sugar beet harvest at his family's field. And I'll take any questions if I have time. The next speaker is, uh, is me. <laughs> So I'm going to talk about mainly the management of uh, Rhizoctonia and Stochaspora and sugar beet, right? So from the standpoint of fungicides, you know, that's the focus of my talk. Uh, I always want to talk about, you know, what happened during the season in terms of the plant samples. Then we'll talk about uh, two different trials for Rhizoctonia. And at the end, I'll just show some of the data from the Stochaspora trial here. So first and foremost thing, right? So we always talk about, we just need to know what's killing our plants in the field. So typically I only show the, the samples, you know, mostly we were, uh, we'll get root samples, but uh, this year we got root and leaf samples separately, right? So predominantly it's Athenomyces, uh, some of the data that Tom showed with the rainfall, you know, April and May, we got, you know, more than normal precipitation. So that explains some of the Athenomyces being a water mold. And then Fusarium, about eight samples, uh, very low rise octonia. And then still, you know, some of those are caused by like chemical carryover, some other issues there. When you look at the leaf samples, uh, I think one thing that was uh, pretty significant this year, uh, talking to my friend Gary here, I think that's the same thing he was observing here too. So more, a little bit of more alternaria in some, in some fields and some samples. And the Sarcospora, so believe me, there's more than two samples of Sarcospora, but these are the ones submitted to our lab because 
about 98% of the times the ag staff is pretty sure if it's a Casper, but sometimes the 2% of the time we still need to you know isolate and then try to see what's causing it. And then uh, other uh, thing in the in the league right now it's uh, stem philium. I think if you remember in 2020 at the reporting session, our colleagues from Europe uh, actually explained what's happening there. Uh, this is something the something new at very low frequency that we recovered from some samples. But every time we recovered stem philium, there was a lot of Walton area, and then maybe there's one or a few spores of stem philium just you know lurking in there. That's how we found this uh, stem philium. And then a the little bit of bacterial leaf spot from a few samples from Southern Minnesota beet sugar co-op. I think all those uh, heavy rain events and some of the you know, strong winds, they cause some tattering of the leaves and uh, it's very easy for the bacteria to get into the leaves, but these are not really causing any damage to the yield uh, or any big concern. We do have some isolates from this, so we are still characterizing those. Uh, just looking at the, typically, you know, whenever you saw alternate area in 2022, that's very classic alternate area, very, you know, uh, very regular shapes, necrotic, you know, primarily, uh, you know, at the margins or where the damage for the leaf. Uh, this is actually another alternate area. This is alternate area as well. Uh, the interesting thing about uh, this year, even I think a little bit of those lesions or uh, some of the necrosis caused by ultra blazer. Those were actually colonized by alternate area. So I would not say it's not even primary or secondary. It's like tertiary, right? It's just, it's a very strong saprophyte. It's just trying to colonize the, you know, dead and uh, dying uh, leaf tissues. Whether it's a cospora, it, it always has uh, reddish brown margins and then the gray centers. And once you see the sporulation, you can just see the fuzzy growth in the center. And again, this is uh, some of the uh, pictures from Netherlands here, the stem philium, it looks very similar to the manganese deficiency. They start as a yellow speckles, but then in the severe conditions, you can see I mean, these are actually looking almost like alternate area here, but very extensive damage in the field. Uh, it appears that certain varieties are more susceptible to stem philium compared to the others. But you know, we don't need to worry about that right now, but I just wanted to just uh, show you this. Coming to rhizoctonia, so typically it can kill the beets before or after emergence, you know, pre or post emergence damping off, or when the beets are even like four or six or eight leaf stage, depending on when the infection happens, right? So you lose the plant, then you lose some of the stands. But as you go later into the season, you can also have a, you know, crown rot or this uh, surface rot anywhere from the top to the bottom of the root, mostly on the surface, or it can actually go inside the root, depending on, you know, when the infection has started. But what we are seeing more and more with the Roundup Ready Beach, right? We are seeing less of this crown rot and you know, you're doing less of the cultivation. So mostly we are seeing rot at the bottom portion. I think I've shown some uh, tactics in the, in the previous years that infrared fungicides work really well for this, uh, the bottom rot. And this is how the rhizoctonia looks on the plates. And then when these beets die and it makes these resting structures and it can survive up to you know, two years in the soil. So when we talk about management of rhizoctonia, you know, that's an, you know, no one single uh, tactic will help, but we just need to combine several different methods. But for today, we're just gonna look at some of the atlanting treatments, specifically C treatments and infra fungicides. And also I will show you some data for the post-emergence trial that's done in 2022. So for the atlanting, we use a moderately susceptible variety, you know, based on the two-year rating, it's 4.7. And we did a lot of stand counts. And also uh, we did the disease CVRT at the end of the season. So it was planted on May 25th and inoculated with a mix of two different, or uh, actually four different isolates, AG2-2, 3B and 2-2-4. So then we could get some disease pressure. So again, a little bit about the rainfall. So just pay attention to the Crookston site here, April and May, a lot of rain, you know, a little bit in June and July, August and September were, you know, fairly dry. So we got a little bit of disease early on and then not so much as we went later into the season. So that will reflect in the data that I'll show you, right? So when it comes to seed treatments, you know, believe it or not, it's, it's a, since 2014, we have a lot of SDHI seed treatments that work very well for rhizoctonia, right? So this is my untreated control. I have a number of plants for 100 foot of row on the y-axis and then the days after planting. My non-treated control started at 149, about two weeks. And then by, you know, uh, three, four and five weeks, reached 188 and then we lost a little bit by uh, 
about five weeks here. And by the time of harvest, we were about 153 for that. So some of the standard seed treatments that are labeled right now. So everything looked pretty good. You know, Cabino was a little bit lower, uh, right, you know, during the emergence, but you know, it caught up with everything else. Uh, Sistiva, Vibrance, you know, Zelterra was pretty good too. You know, Zelterra is very close to Sistiva and I cannot even see the this line there. And then Metlock Sweet and Zelterra. So they all did uh, relatively well. And statistically, there are no significant differences other than this time point. But not for the seed treatments, you know, some of the inferos uh, actually hurt the, uh, some of the early stands. And when we looked at the infero fungicides, again, Quadris, Elatus, you know, Asteroid and Astronaut, it's a combination of uh, hexoxystrobin and also not with extract here. You know, it's uh, slightly for Asteroid, you know, it's uh, higher. And then astronaut was slightly higher than the not treated control. Again, statistically, these are all very similar. So the infra fungicides, you know, we started with really good moisture early on. So this is where you don't see any damage from the infra fertilizers uh, with the starter fertilizers. And then uh, we also looked at headline, preaxer, proline, and propulse. You know, propulse is the one really hurt the stance, you know, for anywhere from the, you know, two weeks from uh, up to three and four weeks after planting, but all the other headline, preaxer, and proline did very good, especially the headline and preaxer. You know, most of you probably use headline if you're not using, uh, you know, quadris or asteroid. And at the end of the season, we actually rate these roots for on a zero to 10 scale. So zero is completely healthy, 100, uh, say 10 is actually a dead plant, or in terms of the root rot, it's uh, 91 to 100%, right? So these are the values that I have in the tables. So when I compare the seed treatments and uh, infero fungicides uh, as two different groups or a contrast analysis, we had 153 beets versus 164 by the end of the season. That translates about 8,700 to 9,000 pounds RSA, which is you know, statistically not very different. But in terms of the root rot rating, you know, it's slightly 7% versus 11%. And 30% of the roots had disease, you know, anywhere from one to 10, you know, on that one to 10 scale versus 25%, right? Not really much towards the end of the season. So bo both of them work really good uh, this year. And I just want to switch gears a little bit and show some of the data from the post-emergence fungicides, right? So typically we say seed treatments are good for, you know, four to five weeks after planting. We looked at the data, but if the rest of the season is dry, then you can still get some benefit. Whereas the post-emergence fungicides, you know, we're, my recommendation is always to go between four and eight leaf application, but we planted these trials on May 25, right? So it's a uh, latest planting date that we have in the last, you know, 10 years or uh, so. That means we had to wait until July 5th, you know, to get those beets a little bit bigger. And then we applied our fungicide treatments and then inoculated with rhizoctonia right into those crowns, right? So we don't use the whole barley grain here, but we just uh, grind it and then use the ground inoculum there. And uh, in the past, we know that you know, band application works really well uh, for the most of the time compared to the broadcast. So that's the reason actually, you know, we wanted to test every single fungicide as both seven inch band and broadcast application. Looking at your surveys, you know, 50% of you are doing broadcast and other 50% you're doing a band application, right? So let's look at some of the data here. So again, it's a very busy table, but you know, I'm just gonna share this presentation on the SBREB website so you can take a look at the numbers later. But my non-treated control where no fungicides were applied, uh, look at this, uh, we lost 33% of the plants from our last stand count until the harvest. About 33% in terms of disease severity, 62% of the roots had some sort of rhizoctonia on them, right? So if you look at the recoverable sucrose per acre, we're only at, barely at 6,000 pounds per acre. That's right there. So I'm gonna show two different rates for quadris. You know, my typical recommendation is about 14 and a half fluid ounce, but we also use 10 fluid ounce, you know, depending on, you know, some years where it's, uh, you know, low to moderate disease pressure, it works very well. Uh, 10 and 14, both of them did really good, about you know, 9,000 pounds RSA, very low rise of tenure root rot rating, and also instance for this, right? Quadris is still good as a post-emergence application. Excalia, it's a relatively new player since the last two years, uh, but the difference in the rate for Excalia is if you do a band application, you have to cut down the rate, like especially for a seven inch band, 
a third of the rate as a broadcast. So that's only 0 0.64 and x scalate two fluid ounce. So they both did very good again in terms of uh, suppressing the root rot and also 92 and 9400 RSA per acre, right? x scale is very good. And some data for asteroid here, uh, that's equivalent to 14 and a half uh, fluid ounce of quadris. And then Elatus, you know, that's uh, that's the one that's recommended by Syngenta, you know, moving on, not quadris. It's a combination of his oxystrobin and also his DHA fungicide. There's a little bit flip-flop of the numbers here in 98 versus 8,900, 85 and 89. You know, statistically, these numbers are very similar. So both of them did uh, really good, right? So... And looking at the band versus broadcast across, you know, five different, you know, the two different rates for quadris and all the fungicides here, 9119 versus 8992. Again, recallable sucrose is very similar whether you did a band or broadcast application. So I think for you, uh, if you have a band sprayer, go with the seven inch band. But I think if you don't have a band sprayer, don't just uh, drop the ball on the post emergence. You can still get a broadcast application. So in summary, uh, the seed treatments are uh, you know, still working well, but they offer protection mostly during early season. When you think about the infero fungicides, they're anywhere from early to mid season. For the post-emergence fungicides, mid to late season, you know, depending on you get a lot of rain in July and August or how much disease is developing. So if you have a susceptible variety, I think the best thing to do is a seed treatment followed by a, you know, the post application. But if you have a field, you know, you're uh, rotating constantly with soybeans and corn, you have to do an infero application on top of everything that you do, you know, to get a decent yield. So the, the other topics, uh, typically, you know, Austin was uh, giving presentations you know, since 2020 on management of Stratospora. Uh, we showed you a lot of data from Crookston site, but one thing that's different in 2022 is we had two different varieties the regular moderately susceptible variety that's 4.9 rating and also CR plus variety for the first year uh, at this site, right? So Stratospora Baticula, it does not need introduction. You know, we see devastating damage from Stratospora since 1980s and uh, as early as uh, 2020, right? So once it makes this conidia, you know, there's millions and billions of them in a particular field. Everything is driven by relative humidity and how warm uh, it can get and then uh, can cause extensive necrosis. So I was driving at 65 miles per hour on Highway 75 and then took this picture. You can see a clear difference between 4.1 and a 4.4 variety for uh, Sarcosper. This is back in 2020, right? So in addition to the varieties, I think the, we rely a lot on fungicides for managing uh, sorry, Sarcosper. But the problem is, you know, we have widespread fungicide resistance uh, uh, for uh, several classes of fungicides. So we have to use a mixture of uh, is, uh, broad spectrum and also narrow spectrum fungicides and also rotate with the different modes fraction. And uh, tolerant varieties, you know, we are already using some, but we have some extreme tolerance to Stratospora. These are called HCT or CR+. So this trial was actually planted in, on May 24th. And then uh, it was inoculated with the inoculum that was collected from the end of the season in 2021 on July 13. You know, that's actually, we coincide the inoculation with the canopy closure. And then we did uh, six sprays at 10 to 14 days intervals. And we assessed the disease, the severity for CLS every time, like twice a week. And at the end of the season, we got yield and quality parameters, right? The spray one is actually done five days prior to our inoculation. It's almost like a spray zero or a preliminary application and then sprays one to five, right? So, so some of the data from 2020 and 2021, uh, I think predominantly most of the work is being done by triazoles. You know, you can do uh, the, the tank mix partners with uh, Mangazab or copper or tins but most of the work is actually done by, you know, ProLine and Inspire XT, very less disease severity compared to, you know, Provisol and then uh, Minerva here. In 2021, not significant disease development at the same site, but you can still see those subtle differences, right? Still those DMIs are doing, you know, heavy weight lifting uh, for that. So if you look at the, the CR plus variety, this is 2.4. Uh, we didn't see a ton of disease developing, so we barely saw some sparks. 
And then you can see these ones are looking more like alternate area here. This is an August 22nd. This is a non-treated control. For uh, non-CR plus with a 4.9 rating, we can see, you know, this is between two and three in terms of uh, disease severity, a lot of fracas for developing, right? So the CR plus control, this is the four weeks after the last picture that I showed you. Again, you know, just by looking at the plot, there's hardly any development of stratospora leaf spot. Whereas for a 4.9 variety, we can see some necrosis on these leaves. You know, it was getting to probably three to 4% severity, which is about six to seven on one to 10 scale for this one. And if you look at the overall disease development, uh, I showed you some pictures for August 22nd, you know, barely it was getting started here but most of the disease was uh, developing between August 25th until September uh, 22nd, right? You know, July, August, and September were fairly dry in Crookston, but still you can imagine, like see how the disease was taking off, right? It just tells you that, you know, just because it's dry, you cannot just give up your fungicide application, especially for a circus for leaf spot. Because once you have the canopy closure, those, you know, if you walk around uh, 5 or 6 a.m., right, you, you know, your pants, you know, you get all the dew on your boots and everywhere, you know, that's what is actually helping Sarcospora there. And look at the CR plus, you know, there's barely any disease development here. And looking at the fungicide spray program here, uh, this is actually based off of our uh, previous few years of experience. So this is based on two triazoles and then Mancozep and then uh, and tin, and also tin and preax at the end. So again, this is mostly focused on the northern part of the Red River Valley in a Crookston and North, you know, especially we don't have uh, any data from the South. But the standard six space program, so this is what I'm calling is a spray zero. And this is our untreated control, right? On one to 10, we are at 6.9 by the time of harvest, uh, 7,500 RSA. And this is actually the net revenue. So we calculated the gross revenue and then we subtracted the cost of fungicides. So that's the number that I'm showing here is the net revenue, but we did not include the cost of application there. And then the column here, that's the gain over control, right? The six, five, four, and three, and then the control. If you look at the disease development, I don't know, you can get any decent data than this 3.2, 2.8, this stepwise decrease. And uh, with the way we assess the Sarcospora leaf spot, you know, typically we don't give like one, one rating to the plot. You know, Austin and the crew, they do like five stops in that uh, 30 foot row. And then we do five assessments and we take the mean for this particular plot. So these are pretty robust ratings that we got here. And you can see gain for each application anywhere from 157 to 190 dollars per acre. So in a year like 2022 with the 4.9 variety, you know this is probably the same thing you have seen in your fields. And this is the CR plus. Uh, again, I'm showing the same six spray program: five, four, three, two, and then one, and then control. And, and obviously, if you're doing only two or three spray programs, we have to tweak this, right? So here, there's only one proline application. It's only proline and tin, and this is just proline and preaxer and doing that. So that our control, look at the numbers, 0 0.3, whether you do six spray application or uh, no fungicide application, it's about 0.3 on a one to 10 scale. Uh, but one thing we don't need notice between the CR plus and then a non-CR plus variety, uh, our planter is having some issues. So the row four was a little tough in terms of the stand establishment which actually disproportionately affected the varieties. The CR plus, we had even lower stands compared to the non-CR plus. So we had 190 beats for 100 foot of row for the non-CR plus, and then about 150 beats for 100 foot of row. So you have to keep this in mind when you look at these numbers. So some of these uh, are probably caused by the low stands as well, the 6,500. But generally you're seeing benefit with the fungicide applications this is actually an anomaly. When I looked at the data, this is the lowest stands, about 145 to 150. Uh, so that's what is reflected in recoverable sucrose per acre. So we're going to repeat this study again in uh, 2023. I want to see if we you know how the results differ. And we also have some data from these spray programs with some skips, you know, for the five spray program is skipping, you know, two and four, three and three. I'm not showing the data right now, but I'll be showing the data during the growing grower seminars. So in summary, I think the fungicides, you know, still a strong tool in our toolbox to manage Trichospora. 
but you have to use the fungicide mixtures and also rotate uh, with fungicides with different modes of action on it. That's the key. And number two, I think time is essence for uh, stratospora leaf spot management, right? So if you miss those, you know, first one or two applications, and in, I mean, you can get a little bit of control, but you cannot, you know, catch up, especially if the DAVs are higher, and then, you know, the conditions are favorable for disease development. So maintain the spray intervals for 10 to 14 days, especially, you know, if you're doing a 10 or bank is up, if you have heavy rainfall, I think you have to shorten the interval to about, you know, eight to 10 days. Otherwise, if you're doing DMI, like what you did in 2022, at least we know 14 days is uh, pretty decent. Uh, CR plus varieties, I think I've seen a lot of data from our colleagues from KWS and Beta Seed and also some of the in-house trials. I think uh, those trials have clearly shown that, you know, using fungicides is also essential for maintaining the CR plus uh, tolerance. You know, in the short term, you may think that, you know, you save some money by not doing fungicide applications. But in the long run, I think Sertas for particularly can be very notorious to adapt. And then uh, you can see some negative consequences. I think we still need to do some fungicide applications, but I think uh, the verdict is not out there. You know, what is the best strategy for CR plus? And then hopefully we can learn from Dr. Khan's team this afternoon, you know, from their own research. So with that, I would like to thank uh, the Research and Education Board for uh, partial funding the, these projects. Uh, lots of uh, help from American Crystal, the seed and chemical companies, and lots of uh, hardworking folks in these projects. I'm very thankful for my team uh, for all the work that they do. Thanks. So I'd like to introduce our uh, next speaker for this morning, uh, Dr. Wanita Ram Chandran from uh, GSDARS in Park. And she's going to talk about evaluation of sugar beet field soil to identify rhizomania resistant breaking strains of beet necrotic yellow vein virus from the Imperial Valley of California, Idaho, Minnesota, and North Dakota. So again, uh, my name is Vanita Ramachandran, and I'm a research plant pathologist with the USDA here in Fargo, and uh, my research is focused on sugar beet viruses. So today, I'm going to show you um, the evaluation of rhizomania that we have conducted uh, across the field uh, in North uh, Dakota and Minnesota. So this slide uh, shows um, the um, sugar beet production across the nation. So um, as the uh, as it's color coded, the dark green to light green, it shows that uh, the capacity of sugar beet production that you can see in the Red River Valley and uh, I mean, um, Michigan and uh, Idaho are the top producers compared to uh, the rest of the uh, locations. And there are a lot of diseases that affect the productivity the productivity of the sugar beet. And among those, there are two viral diseases is the curly top and rhizomania. So rhizomania is a, is a devastating disease if it's not controlled. So um, rhizomania is, uh, otherwise I learned after I joined here from the different cooperatives that it's a sleeping giant, meaning that you know like uh, it, the sports that uh, transmit the virus can stay in the soil like 10 15 years so um it can come up any time if if the conditions are favorable for the organism to, to grow uh, here is the picture of like healthy uh, sugar beet root versus the typical rhizomania symptomatic sugar beet and uh, this uh, kind of uh, heavy symptoms of the hairy root we actually encountered last year, uh, 2021 uh, and 2022 as well. And like I said, the disease is caused by deep necrotic yellow vein virus. It's a uh, um, soil borne virus, and there are uh, about four to five RNA components that makes the virus uh, infectious. But in the United States, we only have RNA one to four, and we have not uh, detected the RNA five yet. So next is the how we are managing the rhizomania. So um, the disease management, like I said, it's basically comes from uh, genetic resistance provided uh, by the host uh, gene. And we do uh, use um, uh, RZ1 and uh, RZ2, and uh, now uh, there is a, there are um, two genes, RZ1 plus RZ2. These two um, are integrated into the commercial varieties, which considerably gives uh, you know pretty good 
um, uh, um, management of the disease. Uh, and there is no any registered chemical treatments that actually uh, can, can um, protect the um, uh, polymyxa. It's a, it's a vector for the virus. And there is no any transgenics uh, host resistance available for the polymyxa as well. So uh, in the field, although the, the disease resistance is manageable in the field, we start uh, noticing the appearance of uh, rhizomania. Uh, as you can see here, here is the aerial view of the rhizomania disease, the strips, yellow strips, and then here is the ground view and the individual plant shows kind of blinkers. And here is the root uh, with, uh, with the uh, classic rhizomania symptoms. So since we started uh, seeing the rhizomania blinkers, so the next question is like, um, um, it, it looks like uh, the, the resistance breaking strains of the virus is appearing. Uh, so uh, we would like to collect the soil and the plants to evaluate for the presence of the BNYDV. And uh, this will give, you know, like the feedback information for the growers to do cultural practices, variety, variety selection, like crop rotation, et cetera. So once we uh, collect the, um, the uh, rhizomania suspicious um, soil, as you can see here, the, the yellow patch in a field. So we collect some beads as well as soil around the beads of the suspicious area. And then for, for the beads, um, we just scrape the uh, hairy roots and uh, we do the ELISA. ELISA is a serological test to detect the BNYDV. And in the case of soil samples, so we collect the soil and uh, we, this is a kind of like a quality uh, comparison uh, in terms of identifying the rhizomania resistance breaking um, strains of the virus. So uh, the soil is used and we plant the, uh, for example, susceptible sugar beet, RG1 sugar beet and RG1 plus two sugar beet. And we take the roots from these bait plants. Basically, we are recovering the virus from the soil at this stage. So we take the uh, roots from these plants and then we conduct the ELISA. So as you see the yellow um, color, meaning that the virus is, that the sample is positive for the virus and uh, colorless shows the negative. And so what is it giving? So this data we actually give back to the cooperative and agronomists. So this give, um, um, you know, um, yeah, informed decision. So this field is does have a virus affecting the rhizomania, and uh, you know there will be a watch out for the future planting. So for the year 2022, um, for the last year, so we collected these many um, uh, samples. The, the location stands for uh, is a different field. So we collected sample from 12 different fields across Minnesota and North Dakota. And uh, the, we collected uh, these many beets and we collected soil. When it says yes, we, have, we got the soil from the corresponding uh, beet location. And no means either we are testing the soil or like if we did not uh, obtain soil for that location. So like I said in the previous slide, so we do the um, um, ELISA testing to identify the virus. And I just want to show you a couple of slides so how we assess the ELISA testing. So in this case, let's say we have like a beat number one. So each beat is individually evaluated. So beat number one, two, three, four. And we do have healthy and positive controls in each diagnostic plate. So this shows the, you know, the reagents and everything is working. Uh, so as you can see here, we have a scale of the, um, uh, um, the estimation scale. So uh, anything above this threshold, we consider as a positive and depending on the you know, value. So it can be um, um, uh, moderately positive or you know, intensely positive. So as you can see, the, the, the value here so for beat number three is high as compared to beat number one. And for the soil baiting, so um, the, we have like susceptible plants, RG1, RG1 plus two, and we do have the healthy and positive controls here. So in this particular slide, I would say that, you know, this soil, whatever we tested is, is there is no concern because none of them are showing positive for BNYVV. So this is another scenario wherein we got more number of beats. And as you can see the, um, the variation in the BNYVV detection. And uh, if you look at the soil bathing, 
um, experiment. So the RZ1, the susceptible shows the high and next is RZ1 and next is RZ1 plus two. So in this case, there is a concern that like, looks like you know the BNYVB is adapting to the, uh, adapting to overcome the resistance provided by the um, uh, plant. And um, so this is the uh, consolidated uh, data that we have um, for the 2022 samples. So among the 77 beats that we tested, uh, 51 showed, um, um, here is the key for that. So 51 uh, beats showed intensely positive for uh, BNYVB and 11 are kind of moderately positive and 15 happens to be negative. And in the case of soil bathing, it's kind of like varying depending on the location, but it looks like overall that like, you know, rhizomania is kind of like coming back based on this assay. So what is next is like, okay, now we know that like, you know, some locations are kind of like showing rhizomania even with the resistance breaking uh, quality. So next is, you know, we take that um, that plant um, roots and then um, isolate total RNA and it goes through the high throughput sequencing. So in this case, uh, you know, after completing this high throughput sequencing, it has the ability to give us the genome sequence or the nucleotide sequence of all the RNA of uh, BNYVV. So after, you know, in silico analysis and then, you know, doing um, functional analysis, we should be able to get the sequence of the uh, virus that will determine what is the difference between that sequence versus the Y type sequence, and then uh, that will give us to identify any changes that occurred, you know, adapting the virus to overcome the host resistance. And this is for the 2021 uh, survey that we did last, la not last year, the previous year. And in this, this is also all these samples are from Minnesota and North Dakota. So we didn't get that many positives in the soil bathing. Uh, and uh, for this, we already completed the high throughput sequencing and, uh, and the data analysis is still ongoing, but here is the preliminary data for the soil bathing assay. So we have like uh, uh, these many samples tested and we have the data back and we got, you know, these many numbers of uh, uh, contacts obtained for uh, each of these samples. And we saw the presence of a beat necrotic yellow vein virus, uh, you know, it's high for in this particular sample versus the rest. And the next one is coming up is this beach soil bone virus. This is also a virus that, you know, present along with the um, rhizomania whenever we sample uh, the classic symptomatic beats. So it looks like it's also kind of like showing high numbers in some of these samples. And uh, most interestingly, we found a, a satellite, you know, like that's also coming up. Uh, although this data is not like the, the contacts are not normalized yet, but you know, like it looks like, you know, we are getting more than beat necrotic yellow vein virus and we are yet to determine what is the role of these, you know, satellites and the BSBV in intensifying the uh, symptoms. So um, in summary, uh, we evaluated suspicious sugar beet and field soil uh, and we do, uh, 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 we detected the uh, BLYVV and we say that that's a measure of rhizomania right now, but you know, it looks like there are other cohorts that are coming along with that. And we will be uh, um, uh, nailing that down to what is the, their role in causing the disease. And then the results indicate that there is a potential occurrence of resistant breaking um, uh, strains of BBNYVV across the fields um, based on the evaluation that we did for 2022 samples. And um, the subset of this 2022 samples, I think many of them are going to be investigated using the next gen sequencing um, to, to, to identify the, the resistance breaking nucleotides associated with the virus. So I would like to thank the SBREB um, Board of uh, Minnesota and North Dakota for funding this uh, project. And uh, I acknowledge my uh, lab people, Eric and uh, China, for doing a great work. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, collaborators, Dr. Khan, um, uh, Joe Hastings, Mark Bloomquist, um, and uh, Emma and Mike Metzger, you know, like uh, they are uh, very helpful in, you know, um, identifying the, the pockets of the rhizomania and then, you know, helping us to get the samples, both soil and beets. And uh, I'd like to thank all the uh, sugar beet seed companies for uh, providing us the seeds for uh, sugar beet genotype testing. 
and um, uh, Dr. Anna uh, for uh, support and I'd like to thank the research unit and the people from the Sugar Beet Research Unit. With that, I stop and take questions. Excuse me. Our next speaker for this morning is uh, Mr. Jacob Rikis from North Dakota State University. Uh, he'll be talking about evaluation of experimental insecticides for springtail and root maggot control. Sorry, we threw your curveball. Um, yes, I am not Jake, as uh, most of you know. Uh, Jake is not feeling well, so I get to present his paper as well. The gist of uh, Jake's presentation or the focus of this was on uh, exploring alternatives, either for root maggot or springtail management. Uh, the materials and methods, these will be fairly similar between uh, Jake's talk and mine. Uh, we uh, at uh, our root maggot trial was conducted at St. Thomas, and I think uh, many of you know, many of you in the room know, well familiar with how severe the root maggot populations are in that area. Uh, the planting date was very late, as has been alluded to already in previous uh, presentations. Um, about three weeks later than we like to do uh, to uh, plant our plots, so that uh, presented some uh, challenges. Um, the plots, uh, as uh, Dr. Peters had pointed out in some of his his uh, uh, photos, there are six row plots, but we focus on and take all of our assessments out of the inner four rows. The outer two on either side are going to be buffer plots. So this uh, first slide is uh, root injury ratings. Uh, so we rate we rate these for uh, sugar beet root maggot feeding injury on a zero to nine scale, zero being no damage and nine being a dead plant. And uh, he's got these grouped by uh, formulation or uh, application timing. So on the far left, we've got three, three granular materials supplied at planting time. And then we've got three three materials here as well that are, these are, uh, sprayable liquids that are applied dribble in furrow at planting. And then the green bars on the far on the right are uh, post emergence applications. Now this is an experimental trial. And so these are single applications, which we would never recommend as a sole uh, mode of control in, in the uh, St. Thomas area or any at risk or high risk area. But we do need to look at them as individuals to see what, what they're bringing to the table. So. What we saw here was uh, provided some optimism. Um, here's our moderate rate of counter. We chose a moderate rate. We had a, a lot of treatments in this trial. So we stuck with one rate of counter. It's a moderate rate just to see if anything in the study was going to be in the ballpark park of a product that we know tends to work pretty well. So we got good results out of Aztec, a smart choice. Really everything from the lavender uh, to your left. Uh, provided very good uh, or significant reductions in in uh, root injury ratings. So we may have something there with some of these products. And uh, one thing to point out, uh, and I'll probably repeat on that uh, through the presentation, but uh, um, the post-emergence foliars were applied later than we would have wanted. We had to wait, as uh, someone else has mentioned, had mentioned, uh, after we finally got into plant in late May, uh, we didn't get a lot of rain to get those plants up and out of the ground. And so we were waiting to uh, be able to put on our post-emergence foliars. So it was not an ideal situation. So I'd really like to give these the uh, foliar um, materials another run to see what we might get out of them. Uh, this is what some of the plots look like. We don't have a picture of every single plot, every single treatment. Here's what our untreated check looked like. And uh, some of those surviving plants, you can kind of see the lines here. Those are actually wheel tracks uh, where the females likely didn't lay eggs. So probably would have been even uh, worse had we not had that issue there. Uh, the counter looked pretty good. Aztec and Smart Choice, you saw in the previous chart, they performed pretty well. Uh, we're keeping the check up on this slide. So we have that as a reference point. Uh, index looked pretty decent. Uh, Echizen, we've uh, seen decent performance out of it in the past. Uh, Delegate, this was the first year of looking at Delegate, and uh, uh, we believe there might be something there as well. Not optimal, but uh, as you look in the following slides, 
the upper right here, Yuma, that is a chlorpyrifos formulation applied at its moderate rate of one pint per acre. So uh, it didn't look real outstanding either under that kind of pressure. And that, again, late application time. And then Delegate, we also ran it as a post-emergence foliar. And uh, again, it, it looked better as an app plant. Uh, here's what the yield results look like. Of course, we're looking for big bars on this, this particular slide and the pattern of performance reflected pretty well those, those root injury ratings. Um, so very good control, uh, excellent yields actually for very late planted plots, uh, you know, breaking 30 ton and 10,000 pounds of recoverable sucrose per acre. So good performance out of those. Uh, not all these treatments here that uh, had separated from the check in the, re the uh, root ratings uh, pulled through in the same manner with the uh, yield uh, comparisons, but we had a lot of variability in these plots too. So, um, so that's the root maggot experimental trial that we ran. Uh, much to our surprise and kind of late in the game, we got a uh, report from a uh, central uh, agriculturist that uh, 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 helped us in inadvertently, I guess, uh, him reporting a problem in a field turned out to be a very, very hefty springtail infestation. Uh, one of the largest I've seen in Red River Valley in quite some time, and it was right under our noses. It was in the uh, Glendon area. So, um, so we, despite it being kind of late in the season, we, we did go ahead and put trials in the grower uh, Brett Keel was very kind. He said, do what you want with it. And so my uh, technician, Jake, uh, took that to heart and he tilled up uh, enough space for us to put in 10 replications of the treatments in three trials. So uh, the downside is, I mean, it's easy to plant plots. Well, it's kind of easy, but it's uh, the, uh, you pay for it in the end with all the stand counts and all the ratings and all the yield and, and, uh, I thank our uh, NDSU and U of M colleagues for helping with harvest because it was quite a chore. Um, so this, this slide is kind of busy. This is the progression of the uh, stand count. So in the center bar, or excuse me, the yellow bar, we had the first stand count just a couple of weeks after planting, uh, planted July 6th, as you had seen in the previous slide, uh, and then three weeks after planting, and then 34 days after planting. So each clustered bar has those comparisons so you can kind of see the progression. So the initial stand counts likely were the combination of uh, think, you know how quickly the treatments were going to emerge, but it also had the springtail X factor effect too. So slow emergence also uh, had to do with springtail pressure. So the, essentially these, uh, so, I, and I know the text is very small. Jake tried to squeeze it in as best he could, um, but we have three rates of counter on the far left, performing pretty well. We have an individual, the C treatments, the three registered C treatments, all performing at similar levels. Um, I was a little disappointed here initially with uh, the Mustang and, and Midac dribble and furrow. We'd like to probably look at those more as T-bands too, because if you look over here, um, Mustang improves with uh, the T-band application. You'll see that more so in the yield, actually, um, as the springtails continue to feed. Um, but we got excellent performance out of a combination of poncho beta treated seed plus Mustang Max as a T-band, much more so than when, when the Mustang was applied dribble and furrow. I know no grower wants to hear that or wants to, or wants to, uh, put nozzles on a multi, you know, a huge planter and maintain them. But I've seen it for close to 20 years that the T-band almost universally outperforms the dribble and furl. And I think we're just getting a better coverage with that T-band, a pressurized nozzle of really coating that seed furl and good distribution of the product. Uh, other products that uh, perform very well or treatments, I should say, were the combination of Pancho Beta and Midac. And then one big surprise, or I shouldn't say big surprise, we hadn't really studied it that much before, um, but we, we did look at Movento as a post-emergent spray, a rescue spray, which would be really nice because I've had to say 
we don't have much for options for you when growers ask about, well, what can I do? My stand's falling apart. Is there a rescue treatment for springtails and sugar beet? And I've uh, had to say no for many, many years. So this suggests possibly we have something there with Movento as a post spray. Uh, this probably is not very visible. Sorry about the overhead light um, that you can't see the contrast that well. But if you do see it, it, it would tell you that that treatment is popping pretty well. And here's that Poncho Beta with Mustang Max as a T band sticking out very good. These were unbelievably beautiful in person in the field. Uh, they were just lighting up like uh, neon almost. Uh, the counter performed very well also. Uh, keeping the check up there like they had done before. There's the Movento and Poncho Beta treatment. Poncho or uh, Movento applied post-emergence. There's a combination of Poncho Beta with MIDAC. So that, that again was a pretty good performing treatment. Uh, just a couple more treatments. Here's our cruiser, also looks good. And then mix it inside, comparable performance. So what did it look like in the yield? Again, remember this is 10 replicates. So it's fairly robust for a one-time trial. Uh, the granules worked very well, as did the seed treatments. But you look over here at the untreated check, pretty much they're universally across the board. Everything is, is providing a, a very, you know, a significant level of benefit with regard to recoverable sucrose per acre. Um, I won't go through this too much. I'll be sharing more of this in the grower meetings. Um, but uh, as you can see, there are differences with regard to this is the not net net revenue. It is revenue over doing nothing. So it's still gross revenue, but it's in comparison to the untreated check. And uh, there's the stand count and then the, uh, the uh, revenue, or excuse me, the recoverable sucrose data suggested we're getting very good responses, easily paying for pretty much every treatment in the list was paying for itself a few times over. So to summarize the presentation overall, with root maggot uh, control, our best performance was out of those at plant granules. To a lesser extent, the at plant liquids. I think we have some prospects with those sprayable liquids, index, echizen, delegate, and uh, maybe indigo as well. Um, you know, some of these uh, certainly, uh, the experimentals I would say would be components of future programs. So maybe looking at integrating them with other uh, application technology. We definitely want to repeat that experimental trial for root maggots under more normal conditions, where especially where we can see what, uh, what we can get out of those foliar applications when more properly timed. Springtail trial, the granules all worked quite well. Mustang, the three inch T band was superior to the dribble and furrow. And then we got good control out of the Neonix, uh, Neonix seed treatments, as well as MIDAC, which is also a neonicotinoid. Uh, and then the seed treatments were augmented. The control that they, that they provided was augmented by using uh, adding another component. So with that, I will entertain any questions. Uh, Peter, am I doing okay for? Uh, so the next uh, the uh, presentation is uh, also by me and uh, and Mr. Rickus. Um, we're looking. So this is again more the search of either registered alternatives or programs, developing programs for managing root maggots. And then we're also exploring some experimentals. And then I'll wrap it up with the root maggot forecast. So the materials and methods are very similar uh, to what I had uh, alluded to before or shared with you before. The differences are instead of stand counts for springtails, we're looking at those uh, root injury ratings. Uh, challenges, I had already really uh, shared with you but we had really tiny plants for those post-emergence foliar applications. So with that, we'll, yeah, and the other X factor, if you will, was despite that delayed planting, wet soils, and even I would say cold soils, they warmed up and, and caught up in degree day units and the root maggots came out pretty much on time. So we had a kind of a bad scenario of 
small and still emergent plants when they were laying eggs. So this uh, first data slide is a all registered products. We're just looking at programs, either single, dual, or triple application uh, components. And so, and you can see right here, the top three are triple component programs, either dual at plant or single at plant protection, followed by dual post-emergence. And these weren't even really optimal, again, uh, the post-emergence applications, uh, they were made, I think the granules were applied two days ahead of peak fly. I would much prefer to have had them at least five days to a week ahead of peak fly, but that's the cards we were dealt. Uh, same with the Mustang Max, that was actually applied two days after peak fly. So to get a response from it, I would say is, is a, a positive thing. Uh, but all of the uh, treatments with regard to uh, recoverable sucrose per acre and tons per acre, all of these treatments, or, or none of them are statistically different from each other. Uh, there are differences in revenue. So revenue is being maximized. And look at there, uh, over 10,000 pounds of recoverable sucrose when it was planted, you know, the last few days of May. So uh, pretty, pretty impressive. And we had very good root maggot pressure at this location. Uh, this is just a few shots of what those plots look like. Uh, down at the bottom, these are just reference points uh, for your, just to see what kind of control you're getting. Uh, so our untreated check here, damage rating, DR stands for damage rating, so the zero to nine scale. Then we've got our Poncho Beta as a standalone. Um, and again, we don't recommend any seed treatment or any you know a lesser performing, a lower rate of a granule at planting, but this gives you some idea of of the benefit you can get by adding uh, and, and, and uh, developing a control program rather than a single component approach. Um, one thing to point out here is, uh, um, interestingly, our number one treatment, if you were not, if you threw the stats out, just looked at revenue, our number one treatment here was Pancho Beta followed, or uh, at the same time as a, you know, Pancho trait Beta treated seed, with the moderate rate of counter, 7.5 pounds, and then coming over with a granular uh, thymid application. Um, uh, not statistically different from this treatment, but numerically, yes. And I think part of what's going on, we've seen it before, when we have an, a high rate of a uh, organophosphate on at planting, and then we have to apply that post-emergence granule shortly thereafter, um, that time that was applied 19 days after planting. So uh, as early as we could to be reasonable and to kind of fit within that window of uh, post planting, but uh, not post root maggot, we needed to have those granules on. So it's a lot of active ingredient to have on those very tiny plants all at once. Uh, the next slide is a similar approach, uh, some singles and then some dual and even triple or quadruple component programs. Uh, the the uh, Again, we've got recoverable sucrose per acre, tons per acre, and then again, that gain in revenue over the untreated check, which is quite sizable in this trial. Um, so we just looked at the moderate rate at planting of, of counter 15 G or 20G, sorry, just to, um, again, to kind of tease out differences so we're not watering down performance of the subsequent treatments. And uh, so the first point I'd like to make on this one or pattern I'd like to identify is that going from a single application to Mustang to a double to a double with a Asana in the middle, and those were spaced probably about four days apart, um, we maximized revenue. It's an excellent amount of revenue per acre. Uh, the other point I want to make, uh, we've got exponent, and I've talked about exponent before. It is a synergist. It synergizes the insecticidal activity of mainly of the pyrethroid insecticides. And uh, so Asana being a pyrethroid, we wanted to look at that. So if we compare Nipson and Asana at planting time, drib dribble and furrow by itself, well, we got a significant increase in yield, 
but we really pushed it up there to where it was not outperformed by the best treatment in the trial. So exponent appeared to be providing a pretty good impact there. It also did not so much, uh, and, and this again, uh, the uh, post-emergent sprays in this trial were later than we would have wanted. I, I, I told you I was gonna repeat that a lot and I am, um, but this, these are light treatments here. The Asana slight, with exponent slightly edged out the Asana alone. Uh, similarly, nips it at planting, followed by a foliar application of Asana. Here's its counterpart, not statistically different, but about eighty dollars per acre increased revenue. So, um, so I feel feeling more confident about the impacts of exponent. Uh, this next trial, the focus was on MIDAC, a fairly newly registered insecticide in sugar beet. Uh, the take home from this was that all of our treatments provided significant improvements with regard to recovery of sucrose breaker and root tonnage as well. They also provided, and now this is root injury rating here, so the lower the number, the better. Uh, they also provided significant reductions in, in uh, root maggot feeding injury that, uh, that uh, validated that uh, the treatment impacts were from the inset. Um, one other thing to point out is, although we did get significant uh, levels of uh, benefit from Poncho Beta and MIDAC as individuals, again, those are those are individual treatments that we wouldn't recommend as uh, put that on and you're good for the rest of the season, but they performed very well, just as, as good, in fact, numerically better than the high rate of counter. So right in the ballpark with a, a pretty pretty solid treatment there by combining those two um, approaches. <clears throat> and then this last trial, we had some experimentals and, and registered products. Veramark and Vanticore are both diamide insecticides, so they would provide a new mode of action. Uh, we were comparing them again with a moderate rate of counter and then the full rate of Mustang either with, sorry, With the uh, with or without exponent as a drip, so these were all uh, dribble and furrow for the liquid insecticides, and then we have the uh, and what I wanted to point out here was that across the board with Mustang Max, we got a significant reduction in in feeding injury, significant increases in in yield, and a doubling of the the uh, gross revenue above the untreated check. So. Uh, pretty significant benefit by including exp exponent with Mustang as well. Uh, Veramark, the experimental, performed quite a bit better than Vanticore. They actually had the same mode of action or same active ingredient, actually. Um, but we were able to apply uh, essentially this, this 10 fluid ounces of Veramark was about 33% more active, I think it was 33% more active ingredient per acre than the 2.5. Don't do the math here, I did it for you. Um, it depends on you know the amount of uh, material per, per gallon. Uh, so the active ingredient was a little higher for Veramark, so we did get better performance out of that. Uh, this is what those plots looked like. And, uh, uh, so here's our comparative uh, plots. We have our untreated check, 7.2 on the zero to nine scale. Our counter, sorry, not sure what, but I'm sure I'm doing that. Um, the counter did pretty well. Um, you can see some contrast there, there though, the dribble and furrow alone of Mustang or tank mix with exponent. We got a better canopy fill with that. Um, and then with Veramark, although it looks like there was a rate response, visually there, we did not see a statistical difference between those two rates, but I think we're, we're definitely seeing something out of that product. So to wrap up, up the root maggot uh, trial uh, experiments, uh, Mustang Max, uh, the at plant was improved by using, by incorporating exponent, the, the synergist. Uh, we did get a positive, response by increasing the number of applications of Mustang over the growing season. 
And then we also got additive control by alternating between Mustang and Asana for three applications total. Asana looked good also with Exponent. Uh, Pancho Beta plus MIDAC looks decent as a program, but we probably still want to, with, even with those two combined, we'd still want to look at uh, being poised and ready under high pressure situations to include a, a foliar application as well. So do neonic seed treatments have a fit in the sugar beet system? I still think they do. I, I've told you in the past, or told the growers in the past, I really think we need to be very aggressive, and I think we do. But uh, when, when incorporating them with a two and three or even four component program, uh, you can do pretty well with that. You just don't want to rely on that seed treatment as a standalone, and you have to be a good post-emergence maggot manager. Counter remains effective as a management uh, product. Climat does as well. We recommend applying them at least five days ahead of peak fly activity. Uh, Veramark and Vanticore, as I mentioned, that offers a new mode of action, which we've been desperately needing for about over, well, probably over 30 years in the sugar beet system. So uh, that's a good thing. Veramark was the one that performed best. Uh, what's their registration status? Veramark is not registered at this point, uh, but it's registered in a lot of things that I think uh, I would guess registration wouldn't be that difficult in sugar beet. Vanticore, actually, I've discovered is registered, uh, but only as a foliar application. So we need to do a lot more work in looking at that product. So... Um, Let's see, uh, I should just ask, are there any questions about the screening trials before I go into the forecast? Yeah. The uh, MIDAC, yeah, so the question was, uh, wh how was the MIDAC applied? That was dribble and furl. It's something we want to explore. Yeah, the question was uh, any work on Mustang, uh, on uh, combining a tank mixing exponent with Mustang for post-emergence applications. And uh, um, so it's definitely something we want to look into. Yeah, it's certainly that's where we that's where we really need um, some help. So, well, I think I'll get into the forecast, give you a little idea of. I, I still see the green sheet, so I hopefully I'm all okay. Um, so here's you've seen this slide before. I added another year, and unfortunately, I mean sometimes it's fun to break records. But in 2022, we broke a record for uh, the population density of the root maggot. This is valley wide. So the worst fly infestations in the last 16 years. Uh, the next slide, most of you in the audience have seen this before. Those of you that haven't are wondering why 2018 is on the top of this. I'll show you, I'll animate this so you can see the progression of populations over the last uh, four years and what we're looking at for 2023. There's 2018, 2020, 2022, and 2023. So not a lot of difference between 2022 and 2023 but we definitely have a problem on our hands. I would say one little um, reason for optimism would be that uh, the root injury ratings that we collected in a lot of those uh, fields that we um, monitored the flies in have trended downward a little bit, Joe. So I'm, I'm tardy on getting you some data, but I have a little bit of good news on that. So I, I wouldn't say, um, let go of the reins of the horse or however, whatever euphemism you want to uh, use there. But, uh, but I think we might have made progress this year. Maybe it was because a lot of people were really worried that, you know, without chlorpyrifos, what are we going to do? And so uh, my, my impression is that growers were pretty aggressive this year. Uh, maybe someone from the audience can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, we do have a long laundry list for both North Dakota and Minnesota as far as high risk areas. I've told you before, uh, this audience and my grower meeting audience is that usually, I used to be able to have high risk on one side and moderate, moderate risk on the other side. I, the last probably four or five years, I've had to put all the high risk locations on one, one slide. And 
and then the moderate ones on, on another slide. I will show more of that during the grower meetings. And by the way, please attend the grower meetings if you are a industry person or a grower, because um, I think I'll include about three of these slides in my grower meetings. There's gonna be a lot more data, a lot more um, kind of results of what, and recommendations on what to, ex what to expect and how to control them coming up. So with that, I'll wrap it up. I want to thank the RNE board for their uh, their uh, confidence in our program and their support over the years. I want to thank the cooperators, uh, Wayne Lassard, Austin Lassard, and then uh, Brett Keel as well. Uh, excellent cooperators. Uh, American Crystal for collaborating with us on the fly counts. Uh, CNR Ventures for helping us with uh, a lot of uh, things, and, uh, namely water. They're our water supply now. Uh, Germains for treating our seed. Uh, and broadly, the seed and chemical and allied ag industry uh, in the region is just, a, it's a great, the sugar beet family is, is awesome. I want to thank my summer crew who did a fantastic job collecting all those stand counts and keeping the plots clean. And then I want to acknowledge the USDA and NIFA support for my program as well. 